me though. Hi everyone. Okay, now I'm recording. Okay, so Will Hermes will be November 7th, um, but today I'm so excited um, to hear Mike Zarkos and Simon Zagorski Thomas talking to us about reimagining practical musicology, making records within research. Um, so Mike Zarkos and Simon Zagorski Thomas will co-present on their new books today, Reimagining Sample-Based Hip-Hop and Practical Musicology, in an interactive discussion drawing parallels between their practice-focused approaches to musicological research. Mike Zarkos's Reimagining Sample-Based Hip-Hop, Making Records Within Records, um, which is out from Rutledge and Focal Press in 2023, presents the poetics of hip-hop record production and the significance of original sample material and record making alongside a companion album that has been created using findings from this research. I'm super excited about that. This dual book album release pursues hip hop sample based aesthetic beyond listening, ultim um, uh, beyond licensing, um, and exposes the author's beat making process as field work. Simon Zagorski Thomas's Practical Musicology, which is out from Bloomsbury from 2022, provides a broader theoretical lens about practical research, research about practice and autoethnography. In particular, it provides a more practical and practice-focused approach to issues that are frequently addressed more abstractly through cultural theory. So um, just to tell you a little bit about the amazing folks that are um, here talking to us, Micah Zarkos, also known as Stereo Mike, is a hip hop musicologist and an award winning rap artist. Um, he won the first MTV Best Greek Act winner with nominations for seven VMAs and an MTV U uh, Europe Music Award. He's the creative director of tech innovation, the tech mm -hmm. innovation company RT60 specializing in intelligent music apps and has led programs in recording, mixing, mastering, and record production at various UK institutions. He's also published ex um, extensively with Rutledge, Bloomsbury, Academic, and the journals Popular Music, Popular Music Studies, and Popular Music um, Education. And under his Stereo Mike alias, he's produced four critically acclaimed solo albums and numerous singles for international artists on labels such as EMI, Sony, Universal, and Warner Music. His self-produced album, XLI3H, has been included in the 30 best Greek hip hop albums of all time. Simon Zagorski Thomas is a professor at the London College of Music, University of West London. He was the founder and co-director of the Art of Record Production Conference, Journal and Association, and also founded the 21st Century Music Practice Research Network. He's the editor of the Cambridge Elements C21MP series, the Bloomsbury C21MP book series. Whoops, I said that. No, that's the same thing. Sorry, current chair of the UK and Ireland branch of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music and an associate editor of the IOSPIN Journal. He's edited collections on record production for Ashgate and Bloomsbury, and his monograph, Mus The Musicology of Record Production, won the 2015 IOSPIN Book Prize. Uh, his latest monograph, Practical Musicology, is published by Bloomsbury, and his most recent, recent album, Phil Failing Upwards was released in January of 2023, and he's worked as a composer, sound engineer, and record producer since the 1980s. So um, everyone, so excited. I think Simon's going to start us off, correct, in our conversation. Um, please feel free to um, share your comments and questions in the chat, and afterwards we're going to um, lead discussion from there. So um, but Simon and Mike, if you, you don't have to watch the chat, we'll just save it all for later and we'll, we'll get the conversation going then. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, thanks. So, um, yeah, we're going to do a quick 10 minute presentation each, just a sort of summary of the books. And then we're going to talk about how the two books relate to each other in various ways and how our research relates to each other in various ways. And then we hope we'll get some questions as well. So I'm going to just start by sharing my screen 
and hopefully making um, this work. So, uh, okay, if I go to that and uh, do that. Okay, I'm hoping that you're all seeing my screen. Um, okay, so I'll kick off. So the, the Practical Musicology book is about understanding music practice, but it, it doesn't aim to understand it from an objective position. It, it's practical, it's about how to do music better, so which is obviously a very subjective thing. And we've given ourselves these 10 minutes each, and I'm going to talk about two typologies that are central to the book. Uh, and so the first of these relates to four themes that I used a lot in this in this book. I introduced them in the in the introduction and then they keep recurring throughout the book and I'll, so I'm just going to go through these and talk about each one a little bit and then go on to a, a second typology. So the first one is about this idea of convergence and divergence and I know there are several people who use this terminology in slightly different ways. So what I'm talking about here is the way that we put ourselves and other people in various categories and and these are based on action i'm very much about the ecological approach to perception and so by categories i mean you know she's the kind of person who blah 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 or is she's the not the kind of person who blah 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 so the convergence and divergence theme is about recognizing that you either belong or you don't belong either in certain situations or in a particular category and how that um, affects your performance, your activity, and, and also how you can work with or uh, against that. The second of the themes comes from this ecological approach to, to, to cognition and the idea that all of our behavior, including thought, is based on learning and recognizing circumstances that provide affordances or possibilities and so I don't learn what a chair is for example in, in an abstract sense I learn that a chair is something that affords sitting down and then so I can relatively unthinkingly transform my interpretation of a table table or a low wall or someone's knee even into having the affordance of a chair and of course, restrictions are the, the opposite of affordances. They're, you know, some things that I know are not possible and some things, although they may be possible, have negative consequences and therefore I'm inhibited about them. So perhaps sitting on a stranger's knee, for example. And then um, thirdly, uh, I won't go very far into this, but this trichotomy, this automatic subconscious and conscious approach to engagement and thought is something that I've taken from Richard Middleton's ideas and developed and I've written about it in the book but also elsewhere as well and it's about the idea that we can solve problems consciously by making connections um, between our existing subconscious schema or our learned activities to, to imagine hypothetical situations or actions that would solve a problem or achieve a goal. Um, and then the fourth, oh, what happened there? Yeah, the fourth of these is schematic representations. So we're very used to the idea of a visual representation of a two-dimensional drawing representing a three-dimensional reality um, like this. Um, but I would also categorize music as a sonic representation of activity and relationships. So activities and relationships conjure up narratives and therefore logical and emotional stories. And as with any form of schematic representation, whatever it might be, we can appreciate both the thing that's being represented, the ideas that are being represented, plus the form of the representation about how elegantly it's being represented and how well it's being represented. So we don't just visual, uh, we don't just judge visual representations on how realistic they are, or photography would have kind of beaten painting and drawing a long time ago. Um, so that's that first set of themes. The second typology is about four modes of aesthetic appreciation. And, and before I dive into this, 
I want to sort of make the point about theory that it's also a form of representation. That if I were if I were king of the world, I'd insist that all statements of theory, including uh, included the phrase "as if." So this theory of matter suggests that we can think of all matter as if it were made of a phenomena called subatomic particles. Or, in my instance, we can think of aesthetic appreciation as if it were comprised of four component types. And it's only about how useful that theory is um, that makes it valid. It's not truth. In, in, it's a mental representation. So therefore, it, it, from that perspective, it's subjective. It may be based on more objective scientific approaches, but it's still an object, uh, a subjective um, representation. And um, yeah, I, so I'll just go into these four in the same way. So uh, the four things that I talk about are the appreciation of correct or expert musical activity through a schema, so a thing that's done well through learned responses. And that can be the thing that's being represented or the form of representation, as I was talking about before. So it can be the kind of emotional narrative that's being represented, or it can be the way that it's represented through the musical activity. And and so I can appreciate the virtuosity or the competence of the performance, but I can also appreciate how it how well it represents um, a particular emotion or type of energy or whatever it might be. So the um, oh sorry that was an example that I didn't have time to use, so I'll just uh, skip past that. So the second of these is the intentional and expert variation of a schema. So a lot of popular music is about convergence, about fitting into a genre. Um, but it's also about variations, relatively small variations of what already exists. Um, and then the third of these is the intensity or the efficacy with which a metaphor conveys an intended narrative. So um, how well do we um, perceive or interpret? How, how much does it make us feel the thing that is being represented? And, and then the sort of corollary of that is the appreciation of the elegance of the metaphor. How much do we distance ourselves from the intensity of the meaning because or in addition to the fact that we like the way it's been said or we appreciate the elegance of that uh, way of saying it. So um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes playing a track from the recent album Failing Upwards. Um, so this is a track called um, uh, Looking for Something New and the, the video isn't the video for this track, it's it's all 12 videos, little snippets from each one. Um, and you can see above there, you can have a look on YouTube if you want to watch the rest of the album. But, um, I'll, and then I'll talk a little bit afterwards about uh, this. So I'm just going to... So, in the early 2030s, we set up the Illegal Underground University, modelled on the flying university that was established in the 1860s in Poland under partition. Also, I was helped by my genetic footprint being transported back in time from 2039 and implanted undercover in my unsuspecting pregnant mother as she parked her Green Bedford CA van in Newell Street, Birmingham. space-time continuum that allowed a momentary coexistence of material from October 2039 and February 1958, the university team could use this gate to alter the structure of the embryo to create particular myelin growth patterns to trigger future neural reactions to future stimuli in the future me. Of course, this is 
created a temporal anomaly where everything we've done repeats infinitely and also changes fractionally each time but none of the participants know if things are getting better or worse and whether this loop can be stopped or reversed. This is both surreal and confusing and compounded by the fact that we're using several of these temporal loops to attempt to create a coherent group whose task is to change the course of history. Sorry, couldn't turn my mic back on there. Um, yeah, so uh, just to, I haven't got, oh, why am I? Sorry, yes, it has done that. Oh, God, what's going on? Okay, there we go. So I haven't got time to explain how I could present this album as practice research, as well as being the practice that it is. But I would say that the key element would be to explain and demonstrate how the value judgments emerge through the process of creation. That area of aesthetics and aesthetic appreciation of how I'm deciding what makes some aspect of the music better for me is a crucial part of practice research. And with ethnography and autoethnography, um, I find that's often the point of difference, although I think that's less true with Mike. Um, autoethnography is often about reflecting on how something's been done, whereas practice research and what I'm calling practical musicology is about creating new knowledge about the process of, of deciding what constitutes better and what the criteria are for judging it. And I know that's a grey area of pro, uh, between these two forms of uh, methodologies. But including the development of an aesthetic decision in the research process is an important difference. And I'll, I'll stop there and I'll just stop sharing and uh, stop the share. OK, and uh, I'll let Mike take over for his go. Thanks, Simon. I'm just going to start the share now. Here we go. Let me know if everything works at the intro and then we can make it better if not can everybody see the the presentation fine perfect uh thanks simon that's brilliant uh it really really gives me a foundation to talk about the more autoethnographical nuanced aspects of, of how i look at practice um so this is uh this book and this album the sort of one thing the one release the the work of the past six years or so ever since I dropped uh, my major label contract to work on an independent album, sort of at the same time as starting a PhD on sample-based hip hop. And, uh, and the, the whole drive was uh, created by a situation in my professional work. When I first signed with EMI, a major label, uh, the Greek version of, uh, of EMI, and I thought that uh, the whole sample-based aesthetic could now be a thing that I can practice absolutely freely. Little did I know that uh, you can be a very uh, small fish in a very large pond in a major label, and that the issues of um, sample-based aesthetics were going to come back and haunt me. And uh, having been a musician myself and having a lot of musicians around me, I thought, maybe some of the sample-based uh, material I was making in my hip-hop practice could be replaced simply by recording other musicians and myself. And soon I found that there was something missing, something missing in the context of uh, why a new recording doesn't hit as well, as hard, as authentically maybe, as a sampled record. And that sent me on this whole quest about the variables of how this conversation of uh, digital sampling and past music converges and works with each other. So this is sort of a quest and a journey of the past six years, so seven years if we include the transition from a PhD to released album and released book. And uh, that's why you've seen this dual screen on my presentation. Um, the book itself deals with the poetics of hip hop, record production, uh, but it's a kind of sample-based hip-hop record production that uses originally constructed sample material, material, 
rather than previously released phonographic content. Now, I'm not the first one to do this. This has been happening for a long time in the history of hip hop, and it was particularly uh, loud. After 1991, there was a, a very loud case. Uh, Bismarck Key was uh, sued and taken to court about sampling big, big chunks of other records and rapping on top, and it was uh, dealt with as theft. After that, there were shockwaves that were, that were sent into the hip hop world and uh, producers were actually very, very, very worried about sampling even, even small snippets of records. There's some very famous cases in this. Uh, one of the most famous ones is probably Dr. Dress, Dr. Dre's case of interpolation. Uh, by this point, Dr. Dre had been quite famous with NWA and he had access to musicians from the P-Funk era that he would sample frequently up to that point. So he actually picked up the phone, being in California, having access to the big studios and having access to those musicians and said, why did you come to the studio? Let's replay some of the stuff you used to play on those records and we'll sample your new playing of those ideas. Uh, the difference this makes is that it takes away the whole issue of mechanical copyright and we then just dealing with publishing or musical copyright songwriting. So the musicians would be credited as co-songwriters, but Dr. Dre didn't have to deal with the labels in the, in the case of mechanical copyright. And there's been many cases ever since. Um, producers like Fran Dukes even created their own sample library companies out of trying to create vintage sounding content that could be sampled in order to give boom bap or sample based hip hop its authentic vibes, so to speak. And this, this all, all of those terms and definitions are something that I've been dealing with and struggling through the book. Uh, so my personal narrative, you heard a little bit about it already. I went from an unsigned artist who could sample whatever they liked because in the unsigned territory, nobody really sues you because there's not a lot of money to be made to going indie, to going major, to then going back to not even indie, but I would, I would call it free uh, or independent or taking my time to deal with this as an art form through, through the process of a PhD. And this is what makes this project particularly practice-based and very much a sort of practice-focused musicology because it's both making and theorizing, researching and making again in a very iterative um, uh, form of process. Uh, so the tangible, tangible gap that I identified in the process of the professional context was that when when you cross over through through those lines of under the radar, slightly over the radar, very much over the radar, your power uh, of dealing with samples, licensing samples, collaborating with musicians from the present and from the past changes. And uh, this has huge implications if you think about it in the sense of the ability to practice shall we say authentically, the, the, the art form of sample-based hip-hop music. -ing. So oh, when you find yourself somewhere in the middle, it's very, very, very difficult to... Celebrate the, the season. Sorry, I'm just hearing some more of you coming back. I hope that's okay. Uh, so when you find yourself somewhere in between those lines, uh, your, your, your process of creating changes, and sometimes if you oh, think, for example, of our students, a lot of us are or have been academics, uh, the way they create content when they're unknown could have huge implications if they cross that line of of having a hit or being signed and what happened to the what happens to their phonographic sources. So for me, this became very much more of a philosophical inquiry about what are really phonographic sources or what is phonographic about sources and the context of the sources and how then that facilitates a process of hip hop or sample based hip hop musicking that very much feeds and amplifies the essence of those phonographic sources. So uh, I guess this project both deals with a very practical conundrum of how can we do this uh, around the licensing world, the licensing context that we live in, but there's a philosophical inquiry about what are the variables, what are the sonic signatures that allows this conversation between uh, present and past music, or even future and past music. 
and what it really is past sonics or past music in this in this context. Uh, so now I'll take you a little bit more through the detail of the book itself and how it deals with some of those questions. Um, it's a bit of a chapter by chapter uh, uh, break break analysis, but uh, I won't I won't take too long per each chapter. The introduction simply places uh, the context of the hippo practice in front of everybody, and and it talks about how sample based producers um, have created a sort of sub sub form of sample based music making, where they create their own source materials in order to sample after. So this is sort of a sub-genre, if you like, or a sub-workflow uh, sub of sample-based uh, hip-hop musicking. And it deals with the context, the legal uh, landscape that necessitates this. But also, I've been talking about this through the, the prism of issues and problems, but it also allows a lot of creative opportunity uh, rather than just dealing with an issue. And then this is where it links very much with the practice-focused musicology that Simon has been talking about. Um, I take quite a quite a big fight with established methodologies, and I try and propose a bricolage way of dealing with new problems or or current issues uh, that affect creative practice. Um, and I talk a lot about autoethnography and multiple methodologies that use autoethnography as a lens to try and draw out nuanced perspectives out of the practice. Not so much to deal with what's good, uh, which is more Simon's take, but what's possible and what's sort of freeing for the creative practitioner in terms of moving along. Under this whole, um, under this whole methodology lies a phenomenological paradigm. I'm trying to deal with sonic phenomena uh, by initially describing them and then trying to draw out layers to try and understand the layers that create, in the end, a multi-layered phonographic contrast because hip hop is a form of music that doesn't just mixes, doesn't just mix elements, it mixes established mix architectures from previous records or newly created records that are supposed to sound like that. So in chapter zero, I sort of rewind a little bit back to the story and I, I have to effectively expose myself as a person in this field. So I'm a white hip hop musician who, who's half Greek, half Croatian, living in the UK, doing black music. So it's very, very important to say, this is who I am. This is the music I love. So I'm one of the diasporic, um, I guess, expressors of this music. So I put myself in the picture, and I start to expose my studio practice as a, as a sort of field work. And one of the fights in this particular chapter is to try and link personal practice to a wider phenomenon, to a wider community. And this wider community is the diasporic hippo of uh, contemporary uh, sample-based hippo music. In. I try to draw out some reflexive understandings and um, some, some form of being able to look back at my own process that hopefully will be useful to other practitioners and theoreticians in terms of how we look at practice. Uh, by chapter, chapter one, we start to go to the, to the meat of the issue. And uh, I start with a case study. And that case study is a stylistic one. I start to deal with blues hop. Blues hop is an actual subgenre. And it's to do with um, hip hop that samples blues, but also a bunch of contemporary hip hop producers and musicians who make their own blues and sample it or create various levels of interstylistic blues uh, hip hop fluxes through which they express themselves. On the one end of the continue, continue we just have people sampling blues. On the extreme end of this same continuum, we have people who make their own blues and hip hop is almost uh, a sub a, a genre that exists outside of of the of the blues. It sort of informs the blues in terms of how we cut, how we wrap on top of the blues. Somewhere in the middle, we have people who create um, a sort of vintage production of blues aesthetics, but on new music in order to sample it. People like Fran Dukes, for example. Uh, the way I do this is by interviewing practitioners from those three extremes, 
and also making my own compositions and trying to find out what works and what doesn't. Maybe what's good, but potentially what works. And uh, by chapter two, I start to go into how the machines and the tools and the instruments of this practice uh, have created expectations about what the content should be that gets fed into these machines. I use the MPC, the Akai MPC, as one of the uh, archetypal machines or instruments. It's sort of like the Fender Stratocaster of hip hop, I suppose. And I use it as a way to say, we have created a bunch of affordances and sonic signatures out of this process initially starting by sampling old records that come from the from the blues tradition what happens if you want to feed those machines and those workflows what happens if you want to create affordances through new music that's potentially produced in vintage styles and this brings to the forefront the idea of we could be making new music but be very much interested in vintage aesthetics so there's a conversation between past sonics and present workflows now this isn't unique to to hip-hop if you think of an album like uh, uh, back to black by amy winehouse salam remy for example um, brings vintage aesthetics into a record that most most audience members might say it sounds a little bit like motown or Stax records or muscle shows but if you put those records next to each other you realize that those uh, sonic signatures are only referenced, uh, what Simon would have called sonic cartoons. They're slightly referenced as a sort of tipping the hat to an era. But the sonics of those records has a lot to do with hip hop, how big the kick drums are, how big the snare drums are, how forward the beat is in a way that uses live instruments, but they're mixed like hip hop. They're presented in the staging of the mix architectures like hip hop. So this is something that we do in a, in a popular music construction that's now so many decades old, shall we say about seven, depending on the medium you choose, where we start to look back at previous decades or even eras or even studios as little signifiers that we use to say, hey, this is cool, hey, this is authentic, hey, this is trying to be soul, hey, this is trying to be 90s boom pop and so forth. So eventually what we draw out of this is a sort of typology of machine aesthetics through the hands of a practitioner that deals with past sonic signatures. Around chapter three, I start to deal with this idea of the sonic past and how it represents itself in, um, in, in all of record making, but particularly in record making that uses past records. So it starts to become a bit of an exponential um, phonography of phonography. And uh, I'm starting to deal with the idea that maybe phonographic context is more important than having to deal with uh, an emulation of past sonic signatures into perfection. This realization came to me when I was traveling around various American studios uh, during this PhD, old school ones, uh, Stax Records was one, um, uh, Chess Records was another, Sun Records was another. Uh, when I was down in Columbia, Columbia in New Orleans, um, I realized that uh, Toontrack, one of the sample libraries, uh, used the studio and the vintage equipment and a bunch of quite old school session players to create a, a country sample library that was absolutely perfect in terms of all the sonic variables, some of which you can see on the screen. And it actually hit me that why is it that in well, what's regarded at least in sample-based hip-hop isn't very much about sample libraries and perfection. We tend to like a little a little ghost moment, if you like, on a record that was never meant to happen. We try and take something out of context that, would, that was made through the context of making a record. And by drawing that out, we put it in a new context and that seems to have some sort of aura or vibe. And that's something, at least in the hip-hop world, we, we, we don't seem to get very much out of sample libraries, at least if you're pursuing this ideal of authenticity. Um, this also brings me face-to-face -face with the idea of uh, hip-hop as a form of material, uh, borrowing a type of material composition where we're actually dealing with the two, three, four, five dimensions of sonics 
rather than this idea of an abstract boring of a riff or a motif. Uh, you can probably tell by now that what I'm chasing are sonics, which have a material um, element to them, rather than the idea of a riff or of a well-known riff. So we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the mix architecture of how this is constructed. And by chapter four, we are now dealing with what those phonographic ghosts might be, what those, I'm starting to call them meta illusions uh, because they're exponential and because I think there's a metamodern aspect at play here in terms of you know the era we live in. It's, it's post postmodern, therefore metamodern. And it's this idea that we, uh, we are pursuing a meta-narrative of some sort of golden era aesthetic. This is very much a hip-hop term. Uh, but we're also extremely cynical about how we construct those things so they work in a very practical sense. It's slightly schizophrenic, it's slightly bipolar. And uh, that was sort of in the middle of my journey. And I found out that, am I trying to create something out of a script or am I trying to make good music, as, as Simon would pursue? And um, in a way, the metamodern structure of feeling of living somewhere between chasing a meta narrative and being quite cynical about how we create those sonics allowed me to think, you know what? I'm I'm another artist in an era of metamodernism of this sort of forces that are fighting each other because of our technologies, because of our histories, because of the context we live in. Uh, what was useful here was to look at performance magic, to look at illusion making, to look at uh, the parallels between the evolution of performance magic and record production as two, two parallel art forms. What you can see on the screen here is how record production went from a documentarian capture idea of we are trying to capture a live event through a gramophone or you know a country record as it's supposed to sound on stage or a big band as it's supposed to sound on stage. Later to the construction of Sonic Illusions, we started accepting the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Iggy Pop can sound like a god in a cave with 8 million guitars going through dub delays and a bass that's distorted. It's something that wouldn't really happen in a real environment. Uh, and that's sort of, I guess most of pop and rock, um, it's a sort of staging illusion that is completely constructed. All the way to what I would call a sample based, electronica, hip hop, beat based production, where we are now taking past illusions and we juxtaposing them in such a schizophrenic way, we're creating a collage of multiple past records, even if they're reconstructed. The parallels to performance magic would be that we went from this belief that magic is an occult thing it's it's actually something uh, paranormal to the idea of illusionism. Somebody's very good at playing those tricks to this idea that now we're starting to use stratagems of, of authenticity, particularly when performance magic goes on TV. So we need an audience to tell us, oh, this actually happened in front of them because we're seeing it in a mediated way. So I guess Jay Dilla would probably be in that in that metaphor of. I know it's mediated, but that's really amazing. How did you do that? Uh, so by chapter five, we're dealing quite deeply into the mixing process in, itself. And what you can see, I'm going to start from the graphic rather than the text here. You can see a sampler. Uh, this is using Mudera's idea of meta music. Hip hop is meta music. The turntable allows us to use previous records. The sampler allows us users to use hundreds of turntables that use hundreds of previous records. And we get to this juxtaposition of meta music, music uh, or phonography made of previous phonography. And here I'm starting to look into how the mixing processes allow us that. And also that perhaps one of the things we like very much in, in hip hop and in a lot of ontological music, which is music particularly made with electronics, we're trying to nostalgically seek pasts that either happened or never happened. One of the examples that I'll play, I'll play you in a second was um, is, is of a jam that was quite punk based. Now, I only uh, happened to live through the end of punk, but I loved it very much. So this is my imagination of what punk would have been if I, if I grew up in a punk era. And that then gets sampled into, into hip hop. So it's this idea of what is otherness in sonics. 
what is this other thing, this thing that has a distant or ontological aura, or what is in ontology a past that was promised but never happened? That now we are recreating through this idea of cynical and ideal metamodernism in order to create source material that then we can use and sample. By chapter six, as you can probably tell by now, I'm going through the process of record production from recording to mixing to mastering, composition, recording, mixing, mastering, and production. And uh, by chapter six, I'm looking at mastering. Mastering itself is one of the processes that creates the, the illusion of sonic past or the variables of past sonic signatures. And that also includes the sort of media things may have been recorded to. A lot of the experiments that are linked to this chapter are about recording elements to old tape, to old cassette, or to emulation of those old technologies in order to create sonic objects with a sort of sonic membrane that's media infused. Uh, Simon has called that media-based staging, and that's been very influential in how I sort of looked at the sonic membrane of, of sonic objects and how that allows them to exist as independent elements, but also as a form of object that then gets mastered within a hip-hop production. So I'm sort of making the claim that a sample-based hip-hop not only uses mixed objects, it mixes and masters mastered objects inside its process in order to create communication between elements that were never meant to be together. So we're sort of trying to preserve their independence as well as blend them in order to create the outputs of sample-based hip-hop. Uh, something that I've sort of called uh, merging of previ previously constructed mixed architectures into staging illusions. And finally, the author just summarizes all of this into maybe three contributions, if I can call them that. Uh, staging theory being expanded ever so slightly to sample-based poetics in a material form of them. A little bit of an exposition of the interplay between beat-making practices and the material, the spatial dimensions of the source objects, whether they're sampled from the past or recreated for that reason. And maybe the, this demos, this notion of how making records within records enables a reimagining of sample-based process and maybe a sort of opening up of future sample-based or, or electronica meta music praxis. So I'll play you an example now that shows a little bit of how uh, 15 minutes, actually it was a 30 minute multi-track. This is the 15 minute multi-track. I won't play you all of it, just snippets. With a few excerpts from the journal, shows you the process of how this iterative uh, methodology of listening, creating, looking at the, at the journal, uh, keeps creating levels of interpretation until we get to the final artifact. Here we go. By the way, guess what? We are what we are. Yeah, well, fucking dirty, aren't we? We're dirty, aren't we? We're dirty, aren't we? So what? So what? Does it sound fucking ace? How he sounds that the world is so broken. Isn't it? Isn't it broken? You stopped me, you stopped me right now. He gave me that, and you never let me stop right now. But you carry it up because you want it. It's not like that. It's not like that. Like her, like her, isn't it? Like her. And then it turns into this. Yeah, well, fucking day, aren't we? Yeah, well, fucking day, aren't we? No, we're all dead, Zara. 
Yeah, well, fucking day I went in the world inside the crowd. Yeah, well, fucking day I went to the same day. Thank you. All right, everyone. That was great. Um, let's let's start the QA. We have some questions coming in. And uh, I'm just going to ask folks to unmute and ask your question, and um, I will go from there. Okay, so Chris Malanfi, you have a great question. Do you like to unmute and ask? Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Hi, everybody. Um, Mike, um, I was just wondering if you'd given any thought to the fact that this year, the vaunted 50th anniversary of hip hop was a weak year for rap and hip hop on the charts, on the release schedule, on the radio. Um, there's been some garment rending over this that like in this, ironically, this year when hip hop is celebrating such a momentous anniversary, it did poorly on the charts. It, the release schedule has been a little weak, et cetera. And I've seen some writing that suggests that hip hop aesthetics, this is where you come in, have been so subsumed into other music, including country, which had a huge year, for example, that rap qua rap is now a step behind the marketplace. Does this theory jibe at all with your scholarship? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because what happens in the charts is very different to the very bubbling and super energetic underground or semi underground or overground. So there's been a huge, I think, I think it's almost going through this split that has, has happened to other musics before, you know, when mm -hmm. rock became stadium, there was a big revival, you know, there was, there was punk, there was a sort of, let's take it back to three chords and the truth. And I think, uh, if you listen to even super hardcore hip hop like Griselda records, etc., I'll, I'll stick to the sonic aesthetics rather than the lyrical themes. Uh, the sonic aesthetics are a sort of complete reinvention of boom bap, but in a way that's very, very fresh, very unique. There's a, there's incredible uh, craft, incredible regeneration happening in those forms of music. Um, it, it's true. I mean, the hip hop and the techniques of hip hop and the sounds of hip hop, particularly the sort of southern sounds of 808s and trap, etc., became pop. So it's very, very difficult to make that separation now, just like rock did it before. Country has done it before. Um, so normally when that happens, there's a huge split where there's sort of little in the in, little in the middle. And uh, I've been listening to incredible hip hop through playlists and through radio stations every day, and none of it is in the top 20. So I'm I'm almost feeling the opposite of what you describe. What you describe is true about top 20 or crossover or mainstream radio hip hop uh, to the point where, you know, I, I can possibly listen to some of the mainstream hip hop. I find it very, uh, I find it horrible. I find it uh, superficial. I find the sounds like they're repeating themselves. I find it pastiche. And I think that's probably what's happened to some of it. Um, and it's because it's 50 years old music, you know, I think I think that's normal. It will it will happen. But it takes a while for the forces of how it's being reinvented uh, interstylistically, but also through this idea of, you know, digital technologies and digital workflows have created subgenres within subgenres. So we almost in an in a non genre era because of the way we disseminate and the way we make music. So, so micro genres are happening all the time with with huge creativity, uh, which is not represented 
in mainstream media. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect I think is that uh, the huge, huge sections of the audience are quite happy not engaging with you know Radio One in the UK or mainstream stations anywhere else. They're just going at it through through playlists or through radio stations that just do that. So this is not something I deal with in the, in the book. It's sort of taking more of a ideological, philosophical approach of what can we do with sonic signatures, past and future musics. So it doesn't quite engage with that. It just deals with the idea that if licensing is going to be a problem that separates, you know, the super famous producers who can license and sample everything through legal money, money power, from everybody else who practices the art from under the radar, what happens in between? And that's a very, very huge part of the community. And one of my answers to that is that uh, maybe if we deal with phonographic context in a different way, uh, there is a way to keep practicing those forms, either through recording engineers who, who record other stuff, or actually, because a big part of this was for universities and for education as well, how could courses that collaborate try and try and actually work with each other and find collaboration that isn't just sampling somebody's motif, you know, sax solo or bass part, but going through a process of creating phonographic context to then sample. That has been a sort of more philosophical answer to that rather than a, um, you know, music industry answer to it, if you like. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next person, Francesca. Do you like to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, um, Simon and Mike, both. This was just a fascinating presentation. And my question is um, just thinking about the, for Mike, um, as you're conceptualizing um, your book, if you found yourself also like thinking about other forms of hip hop aside from music, and I was thinking about dance in particular, just there's something about the way you were talking about pastness, recreation, um, that just made me think about dance. But yeah, just curious. Yeah, I think the biggest connection is obviously I had to go quite vertical with a with the history of phonography rather than the other aspects of hip hop culture. Uh, but hip hop isn't just the music, it's 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 the whole culture. And I think the parallels are, for me, the biggest one has been the embodied nature of hip hop. That's why I felt that I need to take a sonic material approach with this. Um, and it was it was a little bit difficult to phrase initially in academic terms because the way the way I feel the music is actually in the body, you know, and it has physical and psychological effects on me that are very positive, very freeing since I was a kid, you know, it's been a friend and it's been a friend through the amount of bass, through the amount of freshness and, and, um, and you know, freedom it has created for me. Um, and that's been embodied and that's very, very close to the music. It's very close to the graffiti aspect of hip hop as well. Um, but one of the things that happened through the journal is, you know, in the journal, and that, that's why I appreciated the autoethnographic aspects of the of the methodology was in the journals, I could say whatever, pretty much. I could actually say this is not being checked by anybody. This is not an academic submission. This is my thoughts. And and by allowing yourself to do that and to be creating in parallel and to be videoing yourself in parallel. Uh, one of the things I found, this is the closest connection to dance is I had a video of me chopping up previous multitracks that I had created. So on this screen where you are, I had an Ableton multitrack that was playing through. And down here, I had an MPC where I could chop up the incoming multitrack as it was coming through. Now, I, I've been doing this since I was probably 13. I didn't know. But in the video, it looked like I was actually producing something but it was the intensity of trying to find the chops, like it's a vinyl record. It was completely, complete dance, you know, it was completely embodied. And the way the chops, if you think about Jay Dilla, uh, not to compare myself to him, but if you think about how Jay Dilla's mobilizing of chops of past records is, it isn't just about how he triggers them, it's also about how he chops them, how he cuts them into pieces. So, 
uh, only when I watched the video in autoethnographic terms, this interpretation came to me that half the process was done in the cutting, not in the putting it back together. And I was completely embodied and completely, you know, completely connected to feeling the music, feeling the rhythm, trying to find that millisecond between a loose kick drum and a bass drum and a bass guitar where it just felt right. If I looked on a waveform, if I was using more of the left brain and looking at Pro Tools, that would not have come out the same way. And I, and I have examples of the two types of processes and one vibes and the other one doesn't. Actually, can I just say a little something about that as well? Just um, the, what's interesting about that, the, that kind of approach to sampling of it being, I mean, not just a, a kind of montage thing um, or a collage thing, but of looking for, looking for, I mean, it, it, the, the idea of intertextuality is, is, is often kind of talked about in terms of the, the bigger picture thing, but that small picture of which fragment that you choose, which vibe that you pick up on and draw out of something, there, I think that's a, a a very gestural and interesting aspect of it and and a, for me the most interesting sample based hip hop are things where you are taking that kind of unexpected part of a uh, of a record as as you were saying mike the the you know the sort of the bit that you wouldn't expect to be sampled people are always looking for that thing of something that 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 flips the meaning of it or flips the the rhythmic feel of it in a way that gives you a a new set of affordances out of something that is just a very sort of tiny fragment of of that larger picture and and i think um yeah i, I mean i think that's a a very gestural and and part of that bigger picture of what hip hop is, is that it is about that kind of changing an existing world into something that has um, a, a, a new, well, it's got a new vision on something that is existing rather than sort of building something from scratch, if you like, it's repurposing something that exists already in an exciting new way. And it's obviously one of the big changes in artistic practice in the 20th century in any case is that idea of the editor as the artist rather than the kind of primary creator if you like and i think that 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 that's what i mean hip hop for me it's is so much more exciting than a lot of art forms that do that because of that very well unique and creative approach to fragmenting and chipping things into pieces and breaking things up. Sam, you, had a, you had a thing on uh, neural mirroring in, in one of your many writings, and uh, and it was very influential to me because there was um, I was drawing some parallels with uh, an author called Leddington who was looking at performance magic, and he ended up drawing on this notion of belief rather than belief, which is this. Uh, subconscious feeling of something might be right or wrong, even though your 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 rational brain tells you it's safe. Uh, and he used the phrase about, do you believe in ghosts? No, but they scare me. And um, and, I, and I drew a parallel with, the, you know, the record, the 444 record with, there's Jay-Z and Nina Simone on the record, and no ID goes back to his sample-based way of making hip hop. And, uh, the parallel I drew was there's so much mobility in the way the samples are used. There's a call and response in the conversation. And the sonics of Nina Simone are old school. You know, we can hear the old record. We can hear the the, the, the jazz process, the recordings of, of, of past. And Jay-Z sounds present, modern mic, frontal, with beats underneath. And that record is a supernatural collage. You know, if you ask an audience member, do you believe they interacted? They would say no, but it moves me, and you know that's the, that's the that's the neural mirroring thing that I feel with hip hop. That's why you know you you can't not break your neck if the beat is good. It it 
it it makes you dance you know to connect back to francesca's question all right um so i'm going to jump in actually with a quick question for both mike and simon i'm just so this is a broader um, kind of pull back question, but given that you're both um, practitioners and uh, scholars and that you're both interested in practice-based musicology, so you're both in your work, um, you know, Mike, it's, I think very, it sounds like it's very, very pronounced and you talk about your subjectivity and all of that. But I'm just curious, what are the, what are the challenges? You know, what are the things that you get out of this that you might not, get out of it if you weren't so present in the work? And what are the challenges to doing this kind of work? Simon? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think in, in general, practice within universities has always been kind of considered a poor relation to the uh, you know the kind of more abstract theory approach and um and there there are all sorts of hierarchies in the university system about what subjects are more important than others and what areas of which subject areas are more important and i think um that by being practitioners as well as researchers, I think it's it's helped us. Well, it's helped me anyway. I'll talk about, but Mike can answer for himself. But it's it's helped me. Um, well, for a start, realise how under theorised practice is in comparison to analysis, for example, uh, and. And also how many of those things have something in common um, that you can you can reuse. You can you can take aspects of analysis and think about them through a practice frame and get completely different perspectives. And I think um, I think the idea of subjectivity as a, a sort of saying earlier on, I think subjectivity is really important in research and that we ignore it at our peril or try to avoid it at our peril. And, and I think, you know, all of the subjectivities about choosing what to research, about choosing how to research it, these are all perennial problems. But I think that the other thing that practice brings along is the idea of aesthetics and the subjectivity that aesthetics involves and i think it forces us to to realize how much aesthetics informs our sort of selection of research subjects of of what we what we're going to study and therefore what becomes the canon or at least how um you know, things that have articles written about them become some more important than things that don't have articles written about them just on the very basic level. So, you know, by having practice um, involved in that process, if you like, then subjectivity becomes comes more to the fore and our subjectivities become um more obvious to us in terms of of uh of how all the rest of our research questions are being put together and and uh and influenced by things that are completely separate from um so-called sort of objective analytical processes so so-called analytical so, I mean, so-called objective sounds terrible but anyway you know what i mean mike I totally relate to that. And I also just want to add that one of my big fears, sort of being both academic and practitioner in parallel for a couple of decades, was that should I analyze the thing I love <laughs> to such verticality? Will it kill it? Will it take the magic away? And, uh, you know, I was worried about this throughout, all the way, maybe even halfway through the whole process. 
Um, but then I realized um, that, you know, I'm, I'm 45, so I'm make, making hip hop in my 40s. This whole conceptual stance towards it just gave me a new juice of life, you know, a new injection to look at my, to look at the process and the practice in a different way. And, and, you know, this idea of staging within staging, it's kind of like, uh, you know, finding new magical powers, even in some of the things that you always did, but didn't know you were doing, or maybe do them better, because that's that's also important. And uh, it, it I, for anybody worried about doing a practice-based PhD or practice-based research study, I'd say, it's actually fuel, I think. And if we if you think about our some of our favorite artists, my favorite artists have always been completely conceptual artists, whether it's David Bowie or Dr. Dre, you know, whether um, whether it's West Side Gun or or you know uh, Iggy Pop, they've actually come from a concept place to make music that changed the world. It wasn't just making more of the music that existed. They took they took a conceptual stance, and that's the that's the moment where I or the line where I think that's that's also research. It hasn't been written uh, theoretically in such a deep way necessarily. It hasn't been written in an academic uh, language, but some of those conceptual artists did their research. You know, Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, they they changed the world because they were conceptually doing sort of high brain art, if I can call it that. So I don't think there's such a huge separation, but I agree with, with Simon. Some of the structures have made it appear that way, um, particularly in academia, so. I think well, just, just to follow on from that with one more point is that the other thing is that my kind of analytical research has also really heavily impacted upon my practice i mean this this album that i've just made i I've, i haven't kind of sung on an album well i don't know since the 90s or something i think it was um, they've all been instrumental pieces since then um, and it was because i wanted to create songs but the reason in interestingly was that it was an instrumental album that i'd analyzed that made me want to do this it which was um miles davis as you it was bitches brew there i wrote an article about that and the i realized how unique the production approach to that record was and, and production in the big picture production you know the way that miles put the music together um more than just the recording side of things but the way that he put people in the studio and made them work in the studio and i thought i want to do that i want to i want to try what that's like and it and doing it made me understand it in a completely different way and and gave me a yeah gave me a, a different perspective on it that i wouldn't have had just by interviewing people writing about it the doing gave it a, a different type of life, if you like. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay. Uh, Danielle has, um, I believe, the final question for this evening, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's really great to finally meet you all. I've been reading both of your work as I'm trying to get my dissertation album for my life together. Um, I write about the Neptunes and ERD for a Williams, and I just won money to make an album. So, um, you know, send some good thoughts my way because I have been really trying to figure out what this whole production thing is. <laughs> um, but, you know, I actually have a question for both of you. I think I might change it from what I wrote in the chat, which is essentially, you know, um, when, when we're thinking about production and musicology and like making sounds from the past and you're studying albums or you're studying different kinds of ways and then trying to sound them um, for like a particular listening experience for people to have. Um, what are some of the things that you think would be really important to convey? Um, I may ask this a little selfishly to committee members. Um, people who don't do this, right? They they do the regular, I'm gonna write out this article, I'm gonna interview these people, and you know, move on. Yeah, I think, what 
could I say? Well, I suppose in a slightly cynical way, as far as committee members is concerned, I would say that idea of the concept that Mike was talking about, I think that's probably more important than the sound as such, because um, getting getting the feeling of doing something in the way that somebody else has done it is different from you know replicating what they've done sonically um, I think it's more important to sort of say well okay what I want to understand is how that process of uh, you know whatever it might be um, has had how does that reflect in what I want to do how can I how can I use that idea rather than how can I replicate that sound? I think that's a um, a much more important learning process, and it's also kind of more impressive as far as um, uh, you know. It's it the idea of of reenactment and copying is. So, an interesting historical process but it doesn't have that feeling of new knowledge in the same way that being able to say doing what they did I've come up with something entirely new with my own voice um, and and that it was you know I've kind of rejigged their idea rather than I have tried to make myself sound like that person um, I mean I've, I've had PhD students do both of those things um, of, a, of a kind of reenactment thing, which was a fascinating historical project, but it what, what, was it practice research? I suppose I mean it was practice research, but I think it was probably more autoethnography, um, come ethnography, practical ethnography, um, a bit like um, uh, pr practical archaeology where you you kind of you know build a boat the way the Vikings would have built it to see wh whether it floats or not um, and you and you solve the problems that they had to solve um, whereas I think doing it from the creative perspective of saying not I want it to sound exactly the same but I want to use those ideas that to me feels more it's more a process of critical reflection to me anyway Mike you could disagree <laughs> I totally agree like one of the things that I realized when I was especially when I was traveling through the old old studios that produced some of the music I love particularly you know chess records sound records um, was that actually those producers were mavericks who were DIY they were the equivalent of a DIY producer with small equipment, you know, with uh, trying to connect two tapes to create delay because it didn't have a, a spatial processor. So the, oh, you know, in chess records, it's a converted auto sales room and they use the staircase and the lavatory and they put a mic and a speaker in there to, to try and get reverb. So I think that was very, very freeing and educationally also very freeing because I could tell my students and myself uh, you know what, stop copying preset seven from the library of compressors, put a speaker in the garage and record that sound and see what happens. You know, it will be a unique sound that nobody else who uses the Apple loops from Logic House. You know, it will be a very unique sound. Now, first three or four times, it might be out of phase, it might be horrible, it might be this or the other, but eventually you, you, you're you going to rein in your process to, to, I think this idea of, of Simon's, learn from the bravery of the conceptual art rather than the, um, I'm gonna copy that exact sound because if somebody has put that sound in the charts, it's old already. You know, everybody else is after the wave. You know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be at the beginning of a movement or a wave, brilliant, you might peak at the moment of chart success or whatever success means to anybody. But after that, everybody else is a copycat. So it needs, it needs something more. I think that connects to your question about intimacy in the in the in the text because you're creating personal relationships with your heroes from the past. And then it's a conversation rather than a copy. I think that's that would be for me the take. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree definitely that, that if the the historical thing of saying 
you know, I understand their ideas better by having used them rather than trying to sort of recreate them, I think is, is very important. Great. Well, thank you so much. That was such a great conversation. Thanks to Mike and to Simon. Thanks for you all for coming. Um, please join us next week. Will Hermes will be here. Um, he'll be in conversation with Gus Stadler about his new book, Blue Reed, The King of New York. So we hope to see you next week.